Hey friends, Todd here, doing a little late night prophetic pondering about the craziness of the days in which we live and the nearness of the return of Christ for the rapture of his bride. And it is, it is soon. And um, how is everybody doing? It's been a very interesting week, a uh, very challenging week, um, I know for a lot of us. And, you know, yet another mega super high watch time day has has come and gone and we're still here and um i i hope that in in that um you know i i tried to kind of kind of give a warning before we you know before that day hit that you know don't put all your eggs in this basket because one thing that we've learned is that things don't always unfold the way it seems like they will and so and i'm going to touch a little bit more on that um here in just a bit. I've got a few things to share with you. One thing that's just really kind of personal and on my heart, and I'm going to try to do it in a way that is not about me, but it, it kind of is about me. So you're just going to have to, I, I ask that you bear with me, I guess. Um, I, I want to do it in a way that is kind and loving, um, but also encouraging and, and hopefully gives a, shines a little more of a light onto where my heart is and some of the stuff that I say. Um, but before I get too deep in, I've got another thing that I just stumbled on tonight as I was putting everything else together, and I was like, wow, pretty interesting. Um, so before we get rolling, though, I do want to give the gospel. The gospel is the the primary reason why I sit in front of my phone day or night, whenever it is I record, because my hope is that someone that doesn't know Jesus stumbles on a video and is curious enough to click on it and sit with it long enough to hear the good news. The good news is that the broken relationship that you and I are born into does not have to be the end of our story. God went to extraordinary lengths to make sure that it wasn't. You and I are born into a, a condition called sin, and the Bible tells us that sin separates us from a holy God, the God who created you, who loves you, and, and, and loved you so much that they did not want your life to end apart from them and they wanted an eternity god wanted an eternity with you and so as i said he went to extraordinary lengths to the to the point of becoming a man becoming god in the flesh in the person of jesus christ and he went to a cross and died a death that was meant for sinners even though the life that he lived was perfect he he fulfilled the righteous requirement of god so that he could be the atoning sacrifice for the sin of not just you, not just me, but all of us, and not just the sin of your past, not just the sin of today, but your sin of tomorrow and, and, and every day after. All sin is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ that he shed upon that cross, and that is good news. The Bible confirms this by, by giving the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse two, it says, this is the gospel by which you are saved, that Christ died for your sins according to scripture and was buried and raised to life on the third day according to scripture. And it is a gift of God. The Bible is abundantly clear about that as well, that you and I cannot be good enough, we cannot do enough good works, enough charitable deeds, um, be kind enough or good enough to merit the salvation that Jesus offers. Uh, we can't undo sin. Um, we, we can't be good enough. It's an impossible task. And unfortunately, the, uh, the penalty for that sin is, as I mentioned, it's, it's separation from God for eternity. And so how do we fix that? Um, we do so by entering into a relationship with Christ, by placing our faith and belief in him as our Savior. And so if you, if you want to do that, it, here's how it looks. It's as simple as ABC. The A being that you admit that you're a sinner. And, and the Bible is really clear about this. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That, that, that shows you that sin, that's what sin is, and that that's the position of all of us. It's sh falling short of the glory of God, his, his, his glorious standard, and, and, and it's falling short of that. And all have done it. All, all means everybody. Um, and, and then Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. So the wages are what you earn by what you do, right? You work and you earn a wage. Our sin, what we earn for that is death. 
But that verse goes on to say, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so the, it's a gift and it's through Jesus. Those, two, those are two crucial aspects of that verse. It's a gift. You have to just receive it. And it is a gift through the work of Jesus, and which leads to the B and the ABCs, which is believe. You believe that Jesus was who he said he was. He claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be the one who, forgave, who, who has the, the authority to forgive sins. And, and you believe that. Jesus made it really, really clear. In John 14, verse 6, he says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So he didn't, Jesus didn't say, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe sincerely. Jesus made it clear, if you believe anything but him, no matter how sincere, you're believing the wrong thing and you don't get back to God that way. And then if you believe that about Jesus, then the C is just to confess it and to say it out loud. Say out loud what you believe about Jesus. It's, it's really, it's repentance. Jesus preached repentance. The apostles preached repentance. Repentance is, the word repent just means to change your mind. It's a Greek word, uh, metanoia, and it just means to change your mind. So you change your mind about, about sin, and you recognize it for what it is, and you recognize you're a sinner, <laughs> and then you change your mind about who Jesus is, and that he's not just um, you know, a good teacher who got you know, wrongly, wrongly executed. He, he was the son of God who hung on the cross as payment for your sins and mine. And then you confess that out loud. The Bible says that you are saved. Romans 10, 9 through 10 says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So all that said, um, I invite you, if you don't know Jesus, to do that. To, to confess that, to pray that, and to receive that free gift because I truly do believe that, that time, time remains short. Um, we, we, obviously my wife and I, after kind of looking forward to the 20th and thinking that could be, you know, a, a phenomenal rapture day and so much evidence was pointing to it um, and, and it coming and going, we've, we've discussed, you know, what do you do with that? How do you process through that disappointment? And you know, she said, you know, she really wasn't trying to put all of her eggs there, but, you know, she confessed that, you know, I, I was disappointed. Um, and, and I know people have, have wrestled with that a bit. And I know that there are people looking for toward tomorrow because tomorrow, uh, according to some folks, is, is another high watch day, that it could be the true, like, I guess it was like the 20th was the real Pentecost, but now it's like the true Shavuot. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I will be honest with you and, and, and just in... in full transparency. Um, I'm not putting my eggs in that basket. And, 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 and not because I have anything to do with the people that are, that are coming up with the theory. Number one, um, it, and really the most important thing for me, I think, if, I, I believe that if the, if, the, if the rapture will fulfill a feast day, which, which many do, um, I believe it's, I, I always say it's, for me, I'm like eminence with an asterisk, okay? W which means I believe that God is God and God can do what God is gonna do and what God wants to do. And he don't have to run it by me first. He don't have to check with me to make sure it makes sense with me. He's God and he's gonna do what he's gonna do. And so that said, I do believe that we can use our, our minds, our critical thinking, our, our seeing prophetically. We can use those things to try to discern, and, and clearly, Scripture points out that we should. We, you know, we are to watch for that. And so, I think as you watch, you will you will come across days and things like that. And when you come across days that al align with feast days that tend to make sense, that that's that's that merits watching. Um, however, where I was, <laughs> I kind of got derailed there for a minute. Where I was really going with this is 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 this. I, I think if if the rapture is going to fulfill a feast day. It's not going to fill it cryptically. I could be wrong, but I don't think it's going to be like a feast day that like a handful of people are, are on board of recognizing it as a feast day. I think it's going to fulfill a feast day that is at least fairly widely recognized, if not recognized most certainly by the Jews. And maybe, maybe it's not. Here's the thing. <laughs> maybe it's not because... Maybe God doesn't want them to know. 
you know, it, which, which is kind of kind of lead me to to where I want to go um, with, with sharing what's on my heart is there are things that Scripture tells us um, and is very clear about, and there are things that Scripture is like frustratingly, but I believe intentionally vague about, and and I think we have to hold on tight to those things that Scripture is clear about, especially salvation issues. Like hold tight to that. I think I think we need to learn to hold really loosely to the things about which Scripture is not abundantly clear. And I'll get more into that, but I, I do want to. Um, to share just this encouragement. Oswald Chambers, years ago, in his devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, said that the greatest enemy to intimacy with Jesus is Christian work. And I think that's, that's not specifically what I want to talk about, but, but what I do want to kind of, kind of apply that to is, is our watching. Um, Sometimes we can be so caught up in watching that it, it can come at the expense of our intimacy with Jesus. And that is, man, that's where, that's where the joy is. You know, scripture tells us in your presence is fullness of joy. And so we need to really be about being in the presence of Jesus on a regular basis and not just giving him lip service. And I know the rapture is something to, to, you know, it's our, it's our blessed hope, and I look forward to it as much as the next guy, if not more so. Look, I've been, I've, I've been, a, I've been a Christian for a many, many a moon, my friends. Um, <clears throat> I'm 55 years old. Uh, I bought the fire insurance when I was nine. You know what I mean by that, if you don't know, is I was at a church camp that my mom sent me to. God love my mom, and thank you for sending me to Camp Berean way back in the day. But I heard about hell, and I was like, Sign me up for whatever is not that, <laughs> right? Um, but but when I was in high school, I, I was involved in Young Life all four years of high school. And for 12 years as a leader after that, almost went on Young Life staff. Um, but I went to church camp, or church camp, went to Young Life camp in, uh, in the summer uh, of my, between my junior and senior year of high school. And it was then that it like, I got it. I got it. I understood like, this is not just about having the right answers, and it's not just about fire insurance. This is about how, how am I going to live the rest of my life? This is about, you know, commitment. It's about placing my faith in Jesus, and then what do I do to live that out? And so um, that's, that's when I, I think I, I really made it real for me. So, but that was like 1983, y'all. Um, that was a long time ago, and I've been watching for Jesus since around then, um, I, I've, I, like I've, I've, I've mentioned before, I grew up in a house with um, my mom, who is a strong believer and loves prophecy. And so I grew up kind of in a prophecy home. And so I've been looking for, for the return of Christ for a long time. And so I'm, ex I'm, I'm stoked about it. I, I truly am. And, and, I, and I don't mean to like downplay the excitement for that. And we're promised a crown for, for th those who love his appearing, right? And so I, I tell people kind of sometimes like, I may not get any other crowns, but I'm going to get that one. I got that crown coming because I love the idea of his appearing and I look for it. However, this morning, um, I was really wrestling still in my heart with some stuff. And I got in to go get my, my morning nectar of the gods, <laughs> uh, my, my Chick-fil-A Chick unsweet tea that I refill throughout the day with decaffeinated tea so I can actually sleep at night. But I, I'm getting, I get my, my kind of my typical thing is I'll, I'll have my time with God in the morning. I get in the car and I go get Chick-fil-A, get my breakfast. Then I, I'll, I'll listen on the way there and while I'm eating and on the way back, I will listen to, you know, usually I'll pull up YouTube and I'll go to like one of the watchmen that I subscribe to and see if there's something new. And I just felt like today, um, and actually even before then, even in my even in my time of prayer, I've got a daily prayer that I kind of go through, and it's it's not like fully scripted per se, but kind of. Um, and, and but it's long. I mean, I've, my prayer time's like ridiculously long in the morning. Um, but today, I just felt like God saying, "You know what? Like, ditch that for today, and just like, what's on your heart? 
let's just let's just talk. Like, tell me your heart. And it was a little disruptive because that's not like typically kind of how the flow goes. But it was it was so welcoming and so so needed because my heart's been hurting a little bit and and wrestling with some stuff and and not just stuff that I'm going to talk about tonight, but um, we've got some family issues. We've got um, my mother-in-law that's had some 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 really serious health issues. We've got um, some issues going on with my wife's work. There, there's just all sorts of things that I'm not going to get into here, but it's just been it's been a challenging season. And then we go through Sunday and you know thinking, hey man, uh, don't have a there's no problem that the rapture won't fix, right? And um, but, but but here we are. And so I just really took that invitation and, and leaned into God and just kind of shared my heart and I just felt loved on. Well, when I get in the car to go get my breakfast, instead of I, I go to grab my phone and instead of like going to YouTube, I feel like him saying, nah, don't do that today. Like, listen to something that's going to minister to your heart and that's going to gonna nurture you and, and feed your soul. And, and that was like, okay, so I realized I hadn't listened to a, uh, a Wild at Heart podcast from John Eldridge for a while, and I pulled up uh, their app and listened to one of those on my way, and it was, man, it was so much what I needed. It just drew me back into, like it was a reminder of what my intimacy with Jesus should look like, and that Jesus cares about my heart, the condition of my heart, and all of that this morning was just like a great affirmation of that. I say all of that to say this. Um, like, I'm not saying don't watch for Jesus, but I'm saying like, what's, what's going to feed your heart right now? What's good for your heart? What's going to feed and replenish your soul during these days? And, and seek that, seek something, seek, seek that and, and seek intimacy with Jesus. Not just watching for him, but like really press in and and, and ask, ask questions and be quiet and still and listen for answers. Um, I, I believe Jesus don't just speak to special people. I believe Jesus speaks to those who take the time to ask and to, and to listen. And, and not, a, not every time. Um, I, I, hear from, I hear from the Lord, but not every day. And sometimes I ask, you know, what, what do you have for me today, Lord? And it's crickets. So, um, but, but in your presence is fullness of joy. And I think we need our joy replenished and, and, and I say that not just because of disappointment from a high watch day that's come and gone. I say that not just because, um, not just because of spiritual warfare, but there is massive spiritual warfare, but because we, we just live in, I believe we live in the end times and the end times are brutal, man. They, they truly are. Uh, they're rough in a lot of ways and they, they wear on your soul. And so... That's probably enough of a springboard to get into what I really wanted to, one of the things I really want to share with you. And I've got, like I said, I've got another thing in that kind of I stumbled on tonight that I thought's pretty interesting and at least worth sharing because it just shows kind of how sometimes the Lord leads me and where my mind thinks and what, what I hold as, as possibilities. And I think really ultimately as we watch, that's what we kind of have to do. We have to hold things as possibilities unless scripture's really clear on them. But in watching, there's, there's only a few things that the scripture is really clear about. Like in terms of timing, we can try to discern and we, we're, you know, we, we are encouraged to like know the signs of the times. And Jesus gave us specific signs to look for. Um, but some things, I, you know, I don't know that they're they're interesting as we're watching and we start uncovering things and make connections and connect dots and we want to build a case for something. And, and sometimes we come up like day counts, for example. Um, I, I'm as fascinated by them as, as anybody else, but you, you can put all these things together. But when they don't lead to what you think they're going to lead to, they can leave you disappointed. And you're like, ah, there was so much evidence. And it's just, I, I think it's just, um, this is an exercise of faith, friends. We, we know that he's coming. Um, he promised us he was coming. And so every day, as I've talked about before in, in, in previous videos, um, every day that our deliverance is delayed, another soul can come to Christ. And we need to be about the lost folks. Um, and that, honestly, that is where my heart is. That is where my heart is. And I want you to know that. Um, because it's going, to, it's going to help make sense of what, where I go now. 
So a couple days ago, I'm down in my basement having my time with God and my phone rings. And I, uh, I grab my phone and it's a friend of mine that lives out of state now, but was my, my best friend um, through much of high school, all of college and my young adult years, um, was the best man at my wedding. And, and he's, he's telling me about a situation that he's got with someone. And I'm not gonna give details, but it was as he described the situation that he was going through, um, it became very clear to me that, dude, this is spiritual warfare. Like, it's super clear, not just by like how it's coming and the, the, like, the, the means by which it's coming, but like what it's producing in you, uh, that, that's, you, you'll know it by its fruit. And, and it was. And so he, he was actually calling just to ask me to pray with him about this. And so I'm like, let's go. So we prayed about it. I told him that I would pray about it throughout the day when the Lord brought it to my mind, and I did. Um, but an hour later, I'm at Chick-fil-A, and I'm taking the time. I've got like, you know, I'll take a few minutes while, while I'm sitting here, and I'll, I'll flip through the, the comments section on some of my videos and, and try to engage. And I try, I really want to engage more than I have the time to. And I know that so many of you have said that, you know, you understand that, that I have a life and I've got other, other commitments and, and things. And so I, I appreciate that. But I really do enjoy engaging with people. And everyone, like by and large, has been really nice. There's been the occasional person that's like, you know, way off and, and like, you know, goes off and attacks, you know, either the pre-trib rapture or, you know, once saved, always saved. And any, any kind of thing that you can tell when Satan hates something because he comes after it. And so I believe Satan hates the pre-trib rapture just about as much as anything other than salvation because he, he, he wants people to have to experience what he and his followers are going to have to experience because he knows what's coming. And so, um, and he wants people to, to, to believe that they're going to have to go through that too. Because that, talk about a joy stealer. Good night. Scripture says, you know, it's like encourage one another with these words. And I've heard so many people say it before and point out that like very appropriately, if we got to go through seven years of hell on earth, how can you encourage one another with those words? <laughs> you can't. So anyway, so I, I've enjoyed the, the, um, the back and forth and, uh, and really had just good dialogue with people, even about people that don't agree with me on some stuff. And usually it's like, hey, you don't agree that. I don't, um, uh, that's okay. I, I see things differently, but it's not a salvation issue. So let's, you know, just agree to disagree and we're, we're cool. Well, I came across some something and, and I'm, I'm not calling anybody out and I've actually already went back and deleted the conversation. So don't try to go find it because it's not there. But, um, Someone was taking an issue with something that I had said um, a couple of times in, in, a, in my videos when I'm trying to say, trying to kind of think through what might people that are left behind be told has happened. And I've said, like, it, maybe, maybe it's going to look like everyone just vanished, or maybe it just has the appearance that everyone has just suddenly died, but... Whatever the case may be, however that unfolds, we don't know in advance how exactly that's going to unfold in terms of what they try to convince you of. Um, you need Jesus. And, and their point was that, that that's not at all how it's going to happen, that it's going to be a disappearance. And I was like, okay, that's, that's, that's fine. And I, I, I know there's, there's scriptural evidence for that. But I, I went on to explain that what we are not told in scripture is how certain things play out. So I, I want to get into um, the great deception. And, and, and actually, it's called the great deception, like really colloquially, but it's great, great deception is not what is used in the Bible. The word that's used in the Bible is strong delusion. And so... Um, but, but before I do that, I, I, I want to I say, and, and I kind of have to provide a tiny bit of backstory about why I think um, that that's a possibility. Two reasons why I, I, I consider it a possibility that they might try to convince people that everyone's died. Number one, a, a movie. 
years ago, uh, about a year ago, I guess, I watched a movie with, with my family called The Remaining. And it was, I believe it's by Firm Films who did like War Room and uh, Fireproof, and great Christian movies. And th they, they handled the rapture in a totally different way. And I know it was like, you know, it's a creative license, but you know, it, nobody takes offense when we take a creative license that we leave a pile of clothes behind. And like, that's not, you know, show me chapter and verse for that because we, we it's just, it's assumed, but it's not clear. So um, th their premise was that the rapture, it, like you no longer need the, the flesh and blood body. And so it just drops as if dead and with a hollow kind of look in the eyes. And it was creepy. And it's the whole thing's played kind of as a horror movie, kind of a Christian horror movie about, about the rapture because it's, let me tell you, friends, if you don't know Jesus, I promise you, it's going to be a full-on horror movie like you've never seen once the church is removed. Um, but it, it just, for all of us, I think it was like, I'd never thought of that. Really interesting premise. Well, so then fast forward like a little bit of time and we get to 2020 and we're in lockdowns and we've got a medical pestilence raging throughout the world. And now there's been, and I'm trying to kind of phrase things in a way that will keep my video on, on, on online without it being taken down by the algorithms, but there is a massive undertaking, like massive propaganda ridden undertaking to get everyone to do this, to receive something. And you know what I'm talking about. And it occurred to me, it's like, if, if there's a way that, that the people that are behind that can convince everyone that everyone has died from the next version of, of this medical pestilence and you need to come in and roll your sleeve up for, for, for the next round, they would salivate at that opportunity. So now the common, the common thought behind how that's all gonna go down in terms of what is, um, what is gonna be the, the, the excuse is that it's, it's aliens. And look, I, I, I believe that's the most likely scenario as well. I think it, with the, 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 the amount of disclosure that has happened over the, the past, especially over the past, like starting a couple of years ago, but especially over the last year, with at last report um, tomorrow, the, the the public release of the, the Pentagon's um, disclosure on what they know about the UFO phenomenon is supposed to be released. So I, I think there's so much evidence that points to like, yeah, that, that may be how, how, it, how it's gonna go down. But we're not told. And this person was like super convinced that um, nope, it's gonna be the alien thing. That's so clear. And I'm like, okay, where's chapter and verse for that? Is, is what I wanted to say. I didn't, but it's like, it's not, it's not in there. It, yeah, we discern that and we can like put two and two together and see that, yeah, that may be how it goes. But let me ask you something. Since September 23rd, 2017, how many times have we put two and two together and made the most sense of things and built a strong case for the rapture happening only to see that it didn't happen the way we thought it would, right? Um, it, it doesn't always happen that way. So this wasn't just, if it was just like, hey, you know, you, that's not gonna happen that way. And I'm like, well, here's why I think it could. And I kind of gave a little bit of background and like, and, and, and my concern is for my friends. I have, I have great friends that are outside of a relationship with Christ that, I, I mean, short of a miraculous move of God, they're going to go through the tribulation. I have no idea what the, what th those that are left behind are going to tell them. No clue. Could it be the alien thing? Yeah, probably. But, but what if it's not? They're, the, the, the great deception, we, we, we hear great deception and, and we tend to think of it in terms of the lie that is told. What scripture tells us happens is not great deception, strong delusion. And, and I want you to pay close attention to this. I, I wanna look at this verse and I wanna break this down for you. Second Thessalonians chapter two. We're gonna start in verse nine. 
the coming of the lawless one, which, will, which is the Antichrist, will be in accordance with how Satan works. And he's, Paul has just went through and explained that like, this isn't going to happen until the restrainer is taken out of the way. And we know that the church, that the Holy Spirit-filled church, is the one restraining this now. We're taken out of the way. Again, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And here we go, verse 11. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. And so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. So this is not Satan's delusion, friends. This is God's delusion. God does this. So... That's what we are told. And, and, and the word for send is, is the word pimpo. It's Strong's 3992. And it means I send, transmit, permit to go, or put forth. And as you go into the, the Thayer's lexicon, there's two, um, uh, kind, of, kind of two options that it has here. And under the second one, is where this verse, there's only a, a, a small a group of verse that fit into this, this little section, and this verse is one of them. And it means to send, thrust, or insert a thing into another. And it says it includes a reference to equipment and suggests an official or authoritative sending. So this is clearly God sending a delusion that goes to bolster the lie that Satan is putting forth. I found this in Ellicott's commentary for English readers on, on this verse, and, and I thought this kind of nailed it. A terrible combination when God and Satan are agreed to deceive man. It, it, so that's pretty, that's just pretty powerful stuff. So again, what we're told is that there's a strong delusion that is coming in those days, and that God sends it. So, how will God send it? What will he send? How will that look? I have no idea. And you know what? Neither do you, because the Bible is intentionally vague about it. Intentionally vague. I believe totally intentionally. And so, here's, here's where I want to go. So, as, as, as I'm having this conversation explaining that my feelings are connected to, you know, the strong delusion, and I don't know what form that's going to take. And so I just want to try to cover all the bases that I can with whatever lie is going to be told to my friends and fam and I don't think any family that I know of are unsaved, but friends and loved ones that are unsaved that are going to be told this. And, and so I'm just trying to cover all potential bases that I can think of. Well, the, 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 that was not a good enough explanation. And what happened was this um, quickly went downhill. Um, at first, I was accused of twisting scripture. Um, then I was accused of um, changing the rapture, of changing the Bible. Um, and, and I was like, no, that's really not at all what I'm doing. And it's like, well, you say there's going to be. It's like, no, I didn't say it, this is going to be this way. I just said, is it possible Look, if God sends a delusion, is that delusion, is it conceivable that part of the delusion would be to leave our earthly shell here to further the lie? Again, the people that are behind the roll up your sleeve, they would love that. They would love that because that would further that agenda. And people, and if, even if they told you, this is the mark of the beast, this will put you in league with Lucifer himself, they would be climbing over themselves to get it. So, again, I'm just trying to cover my bases. But that explanation was not enough. And, 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 and then it became, I'm a weirdo, and I'm behaving like, have I lost my mind? I'm talking like a lunatic. And, and, and it just became like really personal and really angry. And I was like, I don't even know where this is coming from. And I was like, and so, you know, in my flesh, you know, you, 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 you want to kind of defend yourself. And I'm like, 
I'm the whole time I'm being very intentional about being kind. Um, but I was like, I typed out this long response. Like, I don't understand where this is coming from. Um, accused me of being mad and I'd, I'd done nothing to indicate that I was mad about anything. But, um, I typed it and it's like, as soon as I was done, I just felt the spirit say, now you know you have to delete that, right? And I was like, yeah, I probably should because this is not a situation where the person wants to hear more explanation. They, they just didn't. So I say all that because um, it became odd, or it be, not odd, it became Obvious, that's the word I was looking for. It became obvious, as much as it was to my friend, that this was spiritual. That this was a spiritual, dri spiritually driven thing. And I just told this person, like, you know, this, this is clearly bringing up some things in you that, that, aren't, that aren't good. And, like, I don't want to cause division here. So, really, you, you may just need to unfollow the channel, and that's okay. I, like, no hard feelings. Um, and, and I look, like, you know, I, I, I love being able to be in front of folks and encourage you. I, I, I do. I, I, the, the, the messages that, that I've been an encouragement are humbling incredibly because I know kind of what a, what a mess I am, uh, and that God would use me to bring encouragement is, is incredibly humbling. Um, but, but I, you know, if, if, if anything that I'm doing, or if I'm just not your cup of tea, that's, that's totally cool. Um, there are people I don't watch because they're not my cup of tea and that's, that's totally okay. But, um, but we, what I want to do is encourage us to like, be kind, <laughs> be kind and hold that which is not clear loosely. Um, I want to share uh, years ago, I, um, many of you probably remember, um, several years back, quite a few years back, um, pastor Rob Bell wrote a book called love, love wins. The premise of which was that God is love, and as such, a loving God will send no one to hell. That no one goes to hell. Everybody gets to heaven because love wins. And obviously heretical from the standpoint of not at all what Scripture says. Just not at all what Scripture says. Well, Francis Chan wrote kind of a, a response book called Erasing Hell. And the, the premise of that is like, hey, let's just look at what the Bible says about hell before we say that it's not a real thing. And let's, let's just examine it. And, and he, 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 he's, his, his, his heart in that was like, we're not talking about like who's right and who's wrong. We're talking about people's souls, their eternities. Well, before the book came out, and I bought the book and read it. It's a great book. Um, and, and I <laughs> just knowing I'll probably get attacked for like a, a Francis Chan quote. I mean, that's kind of the, the culture that we're in right now. That like people, I, I talked to a dear brother today and I'm just not gonna mention it because who it was, but I've just, I, he, he just said, you know, we, we have kind of created pseudo doctrines about some of these things about which the Bible is not clear. And it's so true. Francis Chan put out a promotional video for this book. And in this video, he says this, and I think this is just really gets to the heart of, of, of what, where I'm at with this. He says, in Isaiah 55, God says, your thoughts are not like my thoughts and your ways are not as my ways because as far as the heavens are above the earth, that's how much higher my ways are than your ways. And that's how much higher my thoughts are than your thoughts. He goes on to say this. So when we begin an argument with well, I wouldn't believe in a God who would, who would do what? Do something you wouldn't do? Or think in a way that's different than you think? See, and this is, the, this is the critical point. See, when we make statements like, well, God wouldn't do this, would he? Do you understand at that moment that you are placing, you're actually putting God's actions in submission to your reasoning? And that's, that's what I want to talk about with this, like, pseudo-doctrines that we've, like, we've embraced as they're actually scriptural. Like, like, you could actually go to a chapter and verse 
in scripture and say, see, alien, aliens right there. It's going to be told that it's an abduction. When that's not in there. I mean, like, we cannot place the actions of a sovereign God above or beneath our own reasoning. And, and look, as I've mentioned, who, who thought we had it figured out? Like, the rapture is going to be September 23rd, 2017. That was like the big one. That's when I thought, everybody thought, we've, we've cracked the code, man. We figured it. This is how God is pointing everything at this. Now, I, do I believe that September 23rd, 2017 fulfilled the first two verses of Revelation 12? Absolutely, I do. And I think it was a signpost to let us know how close we are. But it wasn't it. And one thing I've learned in, what, 40 years almost, 38 years of watching for his return is that he rarely does anything in the way that I expect he's going to do it. And that goes outside even the realm of watching. Um, God just, he's a God of surprises. And he, he, you cannot put him in a box. You can't. So about something at which the Bible is, clear, is not clear, we need to be very careful about being definitive and being defensive about, well, could it, could it manifest in a different way? Is it possible? Sure, it's possible. And we don't know how it's going to work, but we know that it's going to be something so convincing that it deceives everybody. Um, <clears throat> um, I found this article. Um, Great deception that will see that will deceive even the elect is is kind of the the, the section here. But the whole thing is the, the, the coming great deception. And it, this is further on in the article. I just want to read part of this because I found it interesting that I found someone that kind of saw both, both sides of this coin. Um, what if governments of the world were to announce that space aliens were real and that they are here now? What if we were told that these advanced entities from another planet began all life on this world and have now returned to help us solve all our problems, cure all our diseases, and extend our lives? Would you believe them? Would you believe that the Messiah had arrived to save us? I would not believe it, but many people would, including Christians all around the world. Will it happen? I don't know. But to be honest, I think it's a real possibility. For there is evidence of such a plot afoot. I believe God, and I believe Jesus Christ, and I believe his word for what he said. So I will be very distrustful of what earthly things I hear from any government. I thought that's pretty pretty good insight by itself. He said, No, I'm not expecting this, but I would not be surprised if it happens. The great deception will be organized and controlled by Satan to gain control. Utilizing and building upon the strong delusion that Jesus sends. That's my insertion here. So we must always be aware of what is going on and why. There are many who are expecting this scenario. Some are preaching that aliens, if any, may actually be Satan and his fallen angels and demons, and they could very well be correct. And I believe that they are. But then he says this, but there are other possibilities too. I haven't heard this next idea from any pulpits yet, but the thought has crossed my mind. Could this medical pestilence and roll up your sleeve fiasco be the great deception mentioned? As you're probably aware, it has hurt the Christian church as well as others with the fear and psychological manipulation used to herd and control the population and dictate social changes. Our fleeting freedoms have long been somewhat of an illusion and may well be even more so in a very short time. Like I've said many times, fear is not an attribute of God's Holy Spirit, but it is one of Satan's tactics for control. And he goes on. But I just found it interesting that somebody is seeing like, Hey, there's two sides of this coin. And, and, and part of that is like looking at what's happened over the last year and a half and how, like, look, I, I had to talk many, many people out of thinking that a particular inoculation was the actual mark of the beast. And, and you can prove it scripturally untrue because of scriptural criteria for the mark of the beast, but people still believe that. And I, I, all I can say is that scripture just doesn't support it. There, there are criteria laid out for it, and there's no beast. It, it, it is tied to allegiance to a person who is not here yet. So is it, but is it framework? Is it groundwork? Is it conditioning? 
yeah, for real, absolutely it is. So, again, I, I just wanted to say, like, I, I, I don't know if, if this person that I, that I had this deal with, I don't know if that, that, that was a, uh, you know, if, if that was like, they're not going to follow me anymore. I, I, I offered that, that, and I wouldn't be offended, but you know, I, 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 man, if not, I put an olive branch out there. I mean, I'm not, I'm not wanting to, to be divisive in any way, but my heart is for my, my, my friends who are going to be here and are going to be not only told a lie, but sent a delusion so powerful and strong that it, it supports the lie and it makes it the thing that is like almost indisputable. That's my heart. That's where I'm at in this. And so that said, <laughs> um, I, I've, I've since then, I've, I've looked in comment section of my own videos. I've looked in uh, comments on other people. I've touched base with other people and I can just say this to my unbelieving friends. I am, I'm sorry because Christians do not always come across as the most loving people and don't think it's just with you. We can come across um, really nasty about things that we don't agree with. And I've, I've heard from friends that are like people coming out of the woodwork to attack them um, over things that aren't even salvation related. And um, I, and, and one person said, you know, it's like, I, they believe that, that at this point, Satan knows he cannot stop the rapture. So his, 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 his motive right now is to divide and to, to get us hating each other and to get us you know, fighting with each other. Um, and, and if that's the case, bravo, cause it's, it's working. Um, I see so much division in the body of Christ. Um, I, I, I just, it's heartbreaking. It really is. Um, so I, I would just, I, I just want to put this out there. Number one, just to share my heart, to kind of know where I'm coming from when I've said some of the things that I've said, but also just to encourage us, man, let's, if these really truly are the last of the last of the last days, man, let's be found loving each other and bearing with one another. I mean, crap, man, we're told to love our enemies and we can't even love our brothers and sisters well. Um, and yeah, people, sometimes they go off on a, on a tangent in a, in a direction that you don't agree with. Love them. Love them. Um, man, what would it be like if the church loved each other like the way that we're called to love our enemies? And we're called to love our enemies. That, you know, I heard, um, heard something a long time ago that I thought, man, if we did this, it would, be, it would just work. Um, love them till they ask us why. And I thought, that's... that's, that's missions right there. That's, that's, that's the great commission. Love them till they ask us why. So, so man, let's just love each other, guys. Can, can we just do that? Um, and, and if today, uh, it, or I'm sorry, if tomorrow comes and goes, is it today yet? No, nope, 11.52 at night. So it's not Friday yet. And we're all still here. Um, take courage because don't put your hope in a day. Now, I say that knowing that what I'm gonna share with you here in a few minutes is gonna okay, point to another day. <laughs> so, um, Captain Irony here. But like, and again, I would tell you that whatever I, I or anybody says, if you're watching, you are inevitably going to be drawn to certain days. It's just gonna happen. But don't put your all your hopes there. Don't put all your hopes there. Because again, God doesn't always do it in a way that makes sense to us. But I will tell you this, I believe Jesus gave us signs to look for, and that's really clear. And those signs continue to manifest. They show absolutely zero sign of slowing down. And so I look at those. Those are the markers. Those are the things. The, the other things, they're, they're, they're interesting and cool if they pan out. And um, I don't, I, I'm not... Tomorrow's not a super high watch day for me, like I said. And man, if it if it's if we rapture tomorrow, I will be climbing over everybody else to find the people who who nailed this down and give them a hug and say, "Dude, you nailed it." But I I, I just have I, maybe I'm just too fresh off of the, off of the twentieth. Um, but I just I would love to go tomorrow on Friday, but I'm just kind of I'm suspecting that we won't. Um, and I don't say that so I can be right. 
Lord knows that's not my, that's not my heart. But, um, but I will share with you, I think whether it's tomorrow, whether it's within the next couple of week range that they, they've, they've talked about, um, I am not putting my hope on a date. I'm going to continue to watch for the signs and I'm going to continue to watch as Jesus has commanded us to watch. And everything, not only that I see happening in the world, but everything that's happening spiritually, personally with me, I see these ramped up spiritual attacks on brothers and sisters. Um, I see it. I, I see it as another sign. I, I think Satan knows his time is short. I, I agree with my friend, um, my friend Bree, who said that, who said that, hey, you know, it's Satan, he knows he can't stop the rapture at this point. And so he's, he's out to divide. And I agree. And I think it's just a sign of we're close. I will share just a couple of things. Um, actually, just one thing. You know, I was going to get into something a little deeper, but I, I, I've already went on long enough. I just want to share, like, just, this is just a snippet of kind of some of the things that I get personally that, that remind me, okay, we're still in the season. Like, the day's passed, but it's not about the day. It's about the season. Like, you're in the season. So the other day, I'm spending my time with God, and before I get into my, my prayer time, I, I'm like, Lord, you know, what do you want me to do today? Are we reading today? Are we going to pray? Are we going to listen to a worship song? What, what are we doing? And, and I just it felt like, okay, I'm supposed to pray, or I'm supposed to read, rather. And so I pick up the Bible, and I get that little nudge that, like, you know what? You've had Obadiah pop in your head a couple of times in the last few days. So why don't you turn to Obadiah? And I was like, okay. So I get... You get the Bible and start flipping, and he's like, um, Obadiah 15. And, and it's not always that I get pointed to a specific verse, but I got drilled down to that. And I opened it up, and I already had it underlined in my Bible from reading it, I guess, years ago or whenever it was last time I was there. Um, Obadiah 15 says this, The day of the Lord is near for all nations. Then it goes on to say, As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. But the, the part I had underlined, obviously, is the day of the Lord is near for all nations. So that's what I got led to. And, and that in itself is kind of like just re reaffirming to me that like, okay, Lord, I, I get it. We're still, we're still in the season. It's, it's still close. Um, and as I'm getting ready to close the Bible, he says, what page is that on? And I, I look up and it's like uh, 1355. And I, say, I feel that familiar thing. He's like, look that up. Like, okay. So Strong's Concordance, uh, 1355 is the word deoper. And the definition is for which very reason. Usage is wherefore emphatically, or for which very reason. But what I found really interesting is down in, uh, where did it go? Where did it go? <laughs> Oh yeah, here we go. It, it, it's this. So, um, ooh, yikes, what happened there? Um, it means this, 1355, Dioper. Um, it's derived from uh, 1352, Dio, which is because or therefore, and 4007, which per, which is an emphatic particle meaning indeed. So interesting, like my page number means indeed. The day of the Lord is near for all nations, indeed. Uh, interesting. Again, um, that may mean nothing to anybody else, but to me, that was just like the Lord saying, hold on, dude, we're still in the season. So the last thing I want to um, hit you guys with is, is this. Um, I just found this really, really interesting. And I'm not even, I'm not even sure what, oh, I know what got me here. Um, fascinating sometimes how the Lord works. So several videos ago, I had planned on doing um, another video about the giant. And instead, dude decides to get swallowed by a fish, by, by a whale. <laughs> and, and I was like, well, that's interesting. So that, that's like, that doesn't happen often at all. The giant can wait. Let's talk about my man in, in the mouth of a whale. Um, and so I did a video about that and we, and we talked about, and it wasn't like, I, I think I talked on some other things. I don't remember honestly which video it was in, but, um, but we, we talked about that and about how that was 
really interesting because Jesus talked about the sign of Jonah while he was on earth, and um, and that pointed his resurrection and everything. And then we talked about how that you could make a case because of um, an eclipse that that occurred in Nineveh at around the time that Jonah would have been having uh, his ministry. Um, that that Jonah got swallowed by his fish, you could argue on the same day. It could it it may very well be the exact same day, June eleventh, and um, fascinating insight I thought. And I was like, well, I mean, the, from the Lord. I mean, like that how? Okay, so if that's the case, is the Lord trying to get our attention with that? So again, I felt like it was worthy to spend some time on in, in that video. And, and I had a, a piece that I wanted to, to, to close with because I found, I found a piece and it was like um, five, what was it, five timeless truths from the life of Jonah. And I thought, and, and I read through them and one of them, I just thought, man, this is really good as it pertains to like the rapture and people being anxious to just leave this place behind. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read that at the end. Well, the video closed out and I'm like, oh crap, forgot to read that. Like, well, I'll leave it up for the next time. Well, next video rolls around, and I I forget to mention it again. And I'm like, okay. By the time the next one came around, I think, was was the last one I did, I was like, uh, you know what? I'm just not going to – now it doesn't even feel relevant, so I'll just not worry about it. So coming up on this video, and I was like, you know, we're just past the high watch day. Um, it feels relevant again. Um, we're, we're, we're past a high watch day. Everybody's ready to go to heaven. We're still here. So, um, it, it, it felt relevant. So I dug it up and I started thinking about Jonah and I was like, okay, well, <clears throat> let, uh, let me look at the story again. So I started reading the story of Jonah again and, and I looked at it and, um, I'm just going to read this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. This is after he's spit up, uh, vomited onto uh, dry land. Um, and it, it says, um, Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. It doesn't say they believed Jonah. It says they believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king, he rose from his throne. So it goes on and talks about how they went into the season of repentance. And God had given them this 40 days from the time of the proclamation of Jonah, from the time that Jonah shows up on land and goes into the city, and proclaims 40 more days and then it will be overthrown, there's a period of 40 days that God's given them to get their crap together. Or, or judgment is coming hard. And, um, and, and it says, um, even the king says, uh, the decree of the king says, you know, who knows, God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. In verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. And we know from the next chapter, you know, Jonah goes and camps out on a hill and gets his popcorn and Coke and is ready for the show. But the show doesn't come because in that 40-day period, they repented and God turned. And I found this in uh, a commentary um, this is Matthew Henry's concise con commentary on, on Jonah 3, 1 through 4. This little snippet says, um, 40 days is a long time for a righteous God to delay judgments. Yet it is but a little time for an unrighteous people to repent and reform in. I, I thought that was a really interesting um, insight. And he goes on to encourage you. It's like, you know, you, know, you don't know that you got 40 days left, so... Let's let, let let's get about the business of turning to God. Um, and and something came to mind that I, I found really interesting, and it was and, and I and I touched on this before, and it was Jesus giving um, 
a sign to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were always demanding signs of Jesus. And in Matthew 12, um, Jesus answers them pretty directly. It says in verse 38, And some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the man, or I'm sorry, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. So, Jesus is essentially using the sign of Jonah to prophesy of his resurrection and saying that that's, that's all the sign you're getting, kids. Um, and so, and I'd mentioned that last time, um, but I started recalling some things that um, were, were interesting about this guy's story. Um, and and this idea of 40 days. And so I dug in a little deeper. And so I, I went back to look up um, the sign of Jonah. And I found it's recorded in, in, in other books as well. It's in Luke and Mark. I don't believe it's in John. Um, but um, I found that it's actually, the sign of Jonah appears twice in the book of Matthew. And I didn't, I don't know that I knew that. Um, and I found it really interesting. Now, track with me because this is still kind of fresh and I'm still working my way through it. I talked to my youngest daughter before, um, before she turned in and kind of shared with her kind of what this was. And <laughs> I always ask, and I've asked y'all um, before, it's like, maybe this is just interesting to me, but I, I think this is really interesting. But... In, in, again, the, the first time, Matthew 12, 38 through 42. But the demand for a sign and the sign of Jonah appears again in Matthew 16, four chapters later. And Jesus says this in verse four, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. And I was like, that's what I kind of came to first. And I was like, well, wait a minute, I know there was something about being in the earth as like Jonah was in the fish. And so I look back and it was, you know, a little while later, I was like, oh, wow, that's still in Matthew, but that's earlier. Wait, I had no idea that there were two signs. So if there are two signs, are these two different prophecies perhaps by Jesus? I don't know. I'm not gonna claim it, that it, that it is, but I think it's interesting, and, and I, I want to just press into this a little bit and just take you along for, for, the, for the discovery that I had here. So I got thinking about that. Um, the, first, the first mention of the sign of Jonah is, is, is clearly connected to a, a, near, a, a, a future event, but it was fulfilled near, in the near term. Um, it was fulfilled at the resurrection. The second one is a little vague and ambiguous. However, I went back and I looked at like, well, okay, so if then Jesus left and went away, um, what is this, what's the context of this? So I backed up and looked at the context. And so I went back to the beginning of chapter 16 and it says this, the Pharisees and Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. Interesting. In 12, it just says, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. This one, it's, they, it's specific. They want a sign from heaven. And Jesus doesn't immediately go into that. He says this. He replied, When evening comes, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. 
Jesus then left them and went away. To me, this is where it gets fascinating because now Jesus has given it context. The context is signs of the times. He's putting this in like, you can see all these things happening, but you're not connecting the dots that these are signs that Messiah is with you. I'm like, okay, that's, that's really interesting. So, so then I was like, well, here's what like adds further interest to this. So there's there, the, 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 the 40 thing, the, the, the number 40 appear, it keeps kind of coming up here and this becomes a theme. We know that uh, Jonah preached and they were given 40 days to repent. Um, Jesus gives them the sign of Jonah and he resurrects to fulfill that sign. And what happens 40 days later? 40 days later, Acts 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Interesting. So, He's, he's, Jesus is, is with them for a period of 40 days. One last chance to get your stuff together, right? So now I want to just go into this article just a little bit because there's another 40 that's connected here. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting. It says, Jesus was telling them that similar to how Jonah went to preach to the city of Nineveh, he himself, Jesus, was sent, himself, Jesus, was sent out to preach to a city also. Now, if you recall, the people who Jonah preached to, they listened to him. And because they listened and repented, their city was conserved. However, the people who Jesus preached to rejected him and killed him, which suggests if Jesus is a parallel of Jonah, that means that we should see in history something that took place to the city of those who rejected Jesus. Simply incredible. And he goes on to point out Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was leaving, but his disciples came near him and called his attention uh, to its, uh, the temple and its structures. Then Jesus says to this to them, Do you see all these buildings? He asked. I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Each will be thrown down. He goes on to say, Jesus understood that the people who he preached to and a call to repent would decline him. And given that he understands that he is a parallel of Jonah, he knew that if they rejected him, their city would be ruined. And what city was it that that Jesus was called to preach to? Jerusalem. Jesus basically said to them, listen to me, repent, or the same thing that would have taken place to Nineveh will happen to you. However, they didn't listen. They had him crucified. Now, when Jonah was preaching to the Ninevites, he said that if they did not listen to him, their city would be ruined in 40 days. 40 days is not a coincidence. He goes on, I'm not going to get too much into the weeds. He goes to explain like 40 days and the, the kind of days to years and how there are parallels between days in one part of scripture and years in another part. Again, I don't want to make this longer than it has to be, but um, it is an absolute historical fact that the date that Jerusalem was destroyed and its city overturned was in 70 AD. This is huge because this here is histor historical evidence that precisely 40 years after Jesus was killed in 30 AD, Jerusalem, their city, was destroyed in 70 AD. Now, th there, is, there is no um, universal consensus on when Jesus, um, when Jesus was crucified. Um, it's kind of narrowed down to the two front runners are 30 AD and 33 AD. But it would be fascinating, would it not, if... Jesus prophesied that, you know, he, he was going to, or, or preached repentance, and as a parallel to Jonah, as Jonah, they had 40, they had 40 days to repent, that in 40 years, big time destruction was coming. It's fascinating, but it doesn't stop there, because... The headline from June 12th of 2021, talking about the story that happened the day before, a whale in the USA swallowed a man only to spit him out in 40 seconds. Did, did your eyebrows raise? I don't know if you knew that part of the story, 
But the guy wasn't in the mouth of the whale long, but he was spit out, just as Jonah was spit out, and he was in there for 40 seconds. So, let's back up. The first sign of Jonah, given as a prophecy about the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus resurrects. Jesus then continues to show himself and, and speak about the kingdom of God for 40 days. At the end of 40 days, what happens? Look at, look at this little interesting note. And it, again, it may be nothing, but it stuck out to me. The second time that the sign of Jonah is mentioned in Matthew in, in chapter 16, it says, a wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus then left them and went away. What happens 40 days after his resurrection? Again, Acts chapter 1. Jesus is speaking to them after he said this. He was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. Jesus, just like it says in Matthew 16, Jesus left them and went away. Now, that was in, in, that was in 40 days. What's interesting is that it, it is when you continue to read, there is a connection to that 40 days being fulfilled. Verse 10 says this, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. So there's a fulfillment of the second sign of Jonah by, by Jesus leaving them and went away. Now, is the second sign of Jonah, does it refer, does it connect to 40, 40 days? Um, it does. So it just, to me, begs the question. If, if, if my man in Massachusetts that was swallowed by a whale and was in his mouth for, wasn't swallowed whole, but like was in the mouth of a whale for 40 seconds, is that number coincidental? Perhaps not. Again, maybe, maybe totally a coincidence. Um, but if it's not a coincidence and God is trying to make a point by it, is that, could that point be, y'all got 40 days before destruction comes. Is this a sign of Jonah? I don't know. It arguably happened on the same day that Jonah was swallowed by his, by, by, by his great fish. And it's in the mouth for 40 seconds. I don't know, but I can tell you this. I just added another high watch day to my calendar. Um, and again, I don't put all my eggs there. I'm not putting all my hope there, but I find it fascinating. 40 days from the day that this guy was like, look, Jonah got spit up by the whale and went and said 40 days and judgment's coming. This guy gets spit up by a whale, 40 days from that day would be July 21st, 2021. Not significant that I know of anything related to Jewish history or anything like that. And so I take it, take it with a grain of salt, take it for what it is. Um, I just found it really fascinating as I walked through this, not expecting to find this at all. Um, not expecting that there were two instances in Matthew where Jesus gives, um, gives the sign of Jonah as a response. And one, in the context of you know how to interpret the signs of the time or the signs in the of the sky, but you don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. And I'm telling you, friends, that's what we need to be looking at. What are the signs? Jesus told us to look for them in Matthew 24. And and like what what are the odds? Like both of these occurrences in the book of Matthew, where like most people that if they want to if they're wanting to look for signs that Jesus said would be signs of his coming, they don't go to Luke, even though Luke uh, was it 17 or 21? 21, I believe. Um, uh, Luke 21 has the same, essentially some of the same discourse. Matthew, Matthew 24 like expands and expounds upon it greatly. Um, and there's a whole lot more 
that, that, is, that is said there. So like in the, in the book of Matthew, we've got these two signs. One clearly prophetic about his resurrection is the other prophetic about his leaving them and going away and then his subsequent return. I don't know. Fascinating days in which we live though, right? I mean, it's, I don't know. It makes me smile. Um, I think the Lord's speaking. And um, I, I just want to, I just want to, you know, lean in and try to hear what he's saying, share it with y'all if, if I feel like it's something worth, and, and maybe it's just, who knows? Maybe it's just another signpost. And, and that's, that's cool. I'm not, I, I don't come away saying Todd's setting a date because I don't, I don't play that. Um, I think, like I said before, if, as we're watching, dates will be inevitable. They will. And I'll be as happy as the next guy um, if we go tomorrow. But there's a hint of sadness with that. And I'm going to leave you with what I had planned on leaving with you uh, before, because now it seems really obvious that God postponed me saying this um, to get me back into Jonah again um, in a different time. Again, like I said, I just love the way God works. Um, so these are five timeless truths from the life of Jonah. And this is coming from, and again, I, I, I hope this doesn't come across as being like finger pointing or judgmental because it's not because I, I, I find myself in this. I know that all of us are like, man, we're ready to go. The world is dark and getting darker. And the more we learn about um, certain aspects of this world, just the more it is confirmed it's not our home. But it says this, lesson five. Do you truly want the world to repent or would you rather see it burn? Those people on the opposite end of the political spectrum, those people that practice a different religion, those people who support values that you abhor, do you truly want to see them repent and turn to Jesus or would you rather see them judged? Do we want to see the world repent or would we rather see it burn? That's a heart check moment for each of us because God calls Jonah on the carpet for his heart. From Jonah 4, 6 through 11. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Interesting, like, People that don't know their right hand from their left, I'm sorry, but that could just describe the current condition of the world. I mean, you can't watch the news or read through headlines um, and not come away with, with that. We, we've lost our minds. We don't know our right hand from our left. But again, God's concern is for the city of Nineveh. What I will add to this is his concern is so great, he gives it another 40 days before he lowers, lowers the hammer. This, this guy goes on to, to close it this way. When we show concern about things, but not about people, our hearts are not in a good place. God didn't say the plant wasn't important. He said it wasn't right to show concern for the plant, but no concern whatsoever for the people. Think about how hard Jonah's heart had to have become to walk through the streets of Nineveh for 40 days and preach. That's what he did. And, and I've read this and done some studies. That maybe he preached all 40 days. Maybe he preached just the first day. It's, it's a little unclear, um, but regardless, it, that's beside the point. He looked in the eyes of thousands of people. He saw women and men, young and old, and he wanted them all to burn. And he was angry enough to die when they turned to God. As Christians, I pray we never give off the impression of Jonah that we actually want the world to burn, but that we care more about things or buildings, or that we care more about things or buildings or traditions than we do about people. And I will just add, I don't think that the people that are anxious for the rapture are at the same time wanting the world to burn. Although I have heard, I have heard angry Christians talk about 
people deserve hell and people do, you know, they just, they need to just go to hell. They just need to burn for eternity for what they did. It's like, sometimes we don't know what we're saying. I have to, that has to be a father forgive us. We don't know what we're doing when we say stuff like that. And I don't think that, that, that it's a, it's kind of a default thing that if you want to go to heaven, it means you want the world to burn. That's, that's not my point. But my point is just to bring you back to what I've brought you to several times in other videos is our judge, our, our deliverance is their judgment and our rescue is, is their doom. Um, because, look, as we, as we talked about before, the Lord sends a strong delusion that people would believe the lie. Will people come to faith in Christ in the tribulation? Yes. Yeah. There, there, are, there are witnesses, and there are, there are 144,000 who are, who are ministering, but is that going to be the vast majority? Sadly, it is not. Um, I, I don't believe it is. I believe the vast majority are deceived, and the lie, um, the, 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 the strong delusion supports the lie. They believe it. And so every day that the rapture is delayed, um, every day that the rapture is delayed, another soul has a chance for salvation to come to Christ in faith. So I just had this thought. Why not for the next 40 days? Well, not even 40 days now. Gosh, it's like 27 days or 20, let's see. Yeah, 27 days, 20, 26 by the time, by the time, but 20, let's see, tomorrow will be the 25th, there's 30 days, 30, 5, and 21, 26. <laughs> Sorry, it's now 1230 in the morning. Um, for the next 26 days, whether the Lord comes in, in the, at the end of that or not, whether judgment comes at the end of that or not, can we just spend 26, the next 26 days and at least once during the day, let's offer up a prayer for those that are lost, our modern day Ninevites who are walking around not knowing their left hand from their right as lost as lost can be and in desperate need of a savior. Let's pray for them more than we pray for Jesus to come back. I would even say for the next 26 days, like, I don't know if I'm even gonna pray for Jesus to come back. Like, he's coming back whether I pray for it or not. Um, and, I, and I think we should. I like, I mean, it's scriptural to pray for that. But like, this is eternities, man. This is eternities. Eternities for souls that are lost and bound for hell. Bound for seven years of hell on earth first, and then an eternity of being separated from the God that you and I both are so excited to see. Man, may the Lord burden our hearts during these days for the lost people. That's where my heart is, friends. And so let's love one another, okay? They'll know we are Christians by our love. So let's, let's love one another, okay? And, um, and friends, if you are watching this and you've stuck with it this long and you are not a follower of Jesus, what are you waiting for? Time is short. The last grains of sand seem to be circling the hourglass. And one day... You're going to wake up, and no matter what the story is that is told to cover it up, there's going to be millions of people that were in your lives that are no longer there. And I pray that you'll escape that, and you'll be one of the ones that are missing or, or dead or whatever, <laughs> just to make everybody mad. Um, no, I, I really do. I pray that you will come to Christ while there's time. Place your faith and your trust in him as the one who forgives your sins. He died on the cross for you. Receive that as a gift. Receive salvation, confess it, and, and, and be, as the Bible says, born again, as the old saints would say, you're saved. You're saved at that point. Um, I invite you into that. If you have questions, drop them in the comment section, and I'll do my best to try to locate them. I'm um, probably not engaging for obvious reasons um, as much uh, in the next few days, just to kind of take a little bit of a break from all that. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I love you. It's a privilege and an honor to um, to share time with you. I look forward to sharing time around the, the banquet table in heaven with you um, soon and very soon. Love you guys. Bye-bye.